Well, thanks very much, uh, Matthias and Christina, for, and the Bundesbank for organizing this session. Um, um, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure and it's great to, to present here. So I'll talk about the financial instability, real interest rate, uh, or R double star, as we call it. So notice here that there are two stars, not just one star. And so why do we need another star? Well, um, our reasoning is the following. So you are all familiar with the notion of the natural real interest rate, usually denoted R star. You know, that's, that's a, it's usually defined as the interest rate, um, which, you know, if the central bank sets the policy rate equal to that interest rate, uh, you would have output at potential and inflation at target. Okay, so um, as such, it, you know, and it has a long, you know, it goes back to Wixell and uh, Woodford and then Lauback and Williams and others have proposed ways to measure it and so on. So it's, but it's a notion that it's, it's a concept that relates to macroeconomic stability, inflation and output equal to their targets. Um, what we do in this paper is we introduce a related concept which we call R double star and which is the financial stability interest rate. Okay, and we define it as follows. We say it's the threshold real interest rate above which financial instability arises. So it's kind of a counterpart of R star but applied to financial stability as opposed to macro stability. Okay, so and that's basically the idea of the paper. Now, in the rest of the talk, I will sort of develop that, but this is sort of the, the, key, um, the key point we want to make. We, we want to say, well, you know, there's this object that is relevant and that it's, uh, you know, we want to argue that it's, gonna, it's a useful guide to policy. Um, so, you know, our goal is to, you know, um, map this idea of financial stability, which can be measured in many different ways, onto the policy space, onto a, a something, an object that is directly comparable to the central bank interest rate, okay? And we argue that this um, is a useful complement to estimates of R star as a guide to policy uh, for central banks. So uh, what we do, what I'll do in the talk, what we do in the paper is we first uh, illustrate uh, R double star, the concept of R double star in the context of a simple macro finance model with an occasionally binding financing constraint. So we did that within that context, we, we discuss the drivers and the dynamics of R double star. And here one um, point that we really want to emphasize is the, this idea of that in the literature is sometimes referred to financial dominance, which is that persistently low real rates uh, trigger an eventual decline in R double star. That is, if you see, and I'll, 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 I'll give more detail on this later, but if you see real rates low for a prolonged period, this creates some risk taking in the economy and, and, and eventually puts the economy closer to the financial instability region, which for us is reflected in a decline in R double star. Okay, so this is one of the key things we emphasize using our model. And then, um, so this is sort of the first part of the paper, then we, we go on to empirics, okay? And we, we wanna provide an actual measure of R double star in the data. And, and so we'll do that too toward the end, and we'll show that effectively, the Fed actually tracks R double star when setting the policy rate in periods of financial stress. This is what we find from this. So let me move on and I'll start with a model with, um, within which we illustrate the concept of R double star. And this is a model with financial stability, um, instability or financial stability and instability regimes because of an occasionally binding constraint. So, yes, please. 
Yeah. Yeah. We ignore the downward part, or we don't ignore it, but in our model it doesn't happen. Um, in other models it could happen, in ours it doesn't. I think you, you talk about papers by Brunner Meyer and co authors. Uh, okay. We'll see how the banking model is here. The, in, this, in the way things are set up here, this doesn't happen. Um, If, if you, yeah, if you were to have a model that combines our friction and your friction, then I think you would have this narrowing. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, it makes the job of policy harder because you are, um, yeah, definitely. That's a little bit what, what we emphasize, but yeah. We emphasize the upward part. The downward part probably is also there, so. But yeah, we'll see. In this model, it's more about above. Um, so it's a simple dynamic microfinance, microfinance model with financial intermediaries that face agency frictions in raising funds. So if you're familiar with some of this literature, this is based on Gerler, Karadi, Gerler and Kiyotaki and so on. It's sort of, a, of an evolution of the um, financial accelerator models of BG, Bernanke, Gerler, Gilchrist, and Kiyotaki Moore, and so on. Now, the key thing, um, though is that the, constraint, the leverage constraint that arises from this agency friction is occasionally binding, okay? So sometimes it's binding, sometimes it's not. When it's not binding, we say the economy is in tranquil times, and then the dynamics are sort of the same as a, as a run-of-the-mill DSGE model without, without uh, financial frictions. Now, when the constraint is binding, then we are in the financial instability regime. So then you have financial accelerator dynamics, asset fire sales, higher volatility, and so on. Now what's important is that the real rate is one of the key state variables that determines which regime we are in. Okay, and this, we'll use this point to sort of um, construct our R double star. So R double star is the threshold real rate above which financial instability arises. So it's the rate that makes the uh, credit constraint just bind. So you imagine you are in tranquil times, the constraint is not binding, you hold all the state variables of the model fixed except the real rate, you start raising the real rate until you find the one that uh, makes the constraint just start to bind. So that's what we'll call R double star. And then we'll do the same in the financial instability regime. And so we see our double star as a, as a kind of summary statistic for financial instability, just like our star is for macro conditions. Okay, so you could measure financial stability or financial risks in many ways, and there are many ways in which this is done in the literature, but this is one summary statistic that we think is useful because it's directly comparable to the policy rate. Okay. We won't have, we don't have sticky prices or anything like that here. So it's a real model. Um, it's a real model in which uh, R is actually exogenous. So I'll talk about this. It's almost like a small, it's kind of like a small open economy. Um, so yeah, we, are, we hope to go there, but for now, uh, this is what, you know, we think it makes the point simpler if we do it this way. Totally, totally, yeah, we'll, we'll, and we, we, we have this object that is floating around, you'll see it, we call the R gap. So R gap is R double star minus R, so that's exactly for that reason. Where R is, where R double star is, that's kind of the space. Yeah, absolutely. So that's really what matters. Um, 
sorry. Um, let me uh, sketch the model quickly. I won't give all the details, just the basics, uh, just the basic elements. So we have bankers who hold risky capital S and a safe asset B. And we have households who consume, supply labor to firms, and save through bank deposits D. So the balance sheets of the banks looks like the following. On the asset side, they have risky assets S and safe assets B. On the liability side, they have deposits uh, owed to households D and their own net worth. The real rate R is exogenous. Okay, and as I was saying just now, in the background, we're thinking of monetary policy as determining, as determining R, but we don't make this explicit in the paper. We find it more useful to just say R is exogenous. For a given R, what is R double star? So we can think of this R as R star, if you want. And you, you might think that policy is just tracking R star in this model so that, there's, um, so that the consequences of uh, price rigidities are, are eliminated. Um, so this is the problem of a banker. Uh, you know, um, the Gerler Karadi type uh, model, this is very similar. So the banker has net worth N. And this value is obtained by maximizing, choosing risky and safe assets, S and B, the expected um, uh, discount value of the, what the banker pays out to the household. So in this model, the banker uh, stochastically, so each period they exit with a uh, one minus sigma. When they exit, they pay net worth, net worth to the household. And then the household is valued using uh, lambda here is a household stochastic discount factor. If they don't exit with probability sigma, then they get the next period value. Okay? The evolution of net worth is just um, the excess return of uh, risky assets over the risk free rate multiplied times the value of those assets. Here, Q is the price of capital, um, and plus the risk-free rate times previous period net worth. And here, I have eliminated the safe assets from the uh, net worth evolution equation because there is perfect arbitrage for those. So this forces the rate on the, on the deposits uh, that the banker pays to the households to be equal to R, which is the rate that these safe assets pay. So that, that part kind of vanishes. Uh, the key part of the model is what is this occasionally binding leverage constraint. Um, so bankers leverage is assets, risky assets to net worth. That's how we define it. And because of an agency friction, uh, this, um, there's a limit uh, on the banker, on the amount of leverage that the banker can take on, which is endogenous. And this, this sort of comes from an agency friction. Essentially, there's a, a limited enforcement problem here whereby the bank can uh, instead of repaying its creditors can decide to walk away, uh, not repay, and sort of take, take home a fraction of the assets. And here, an important part of the model is that the degree of these frictions, which is measured in this model by this parameter, by this function theta, that's the amount that the banker can take, can walk away with, that uh, depends on the composition of the banker's assets. And in particular, we assume that the degree of friction is higher when the, the ratio of risky to safe assets is higher. Um, okay, so here's the notion is that, you know, a banker that has a very, very risky balance sheet uh, is subject to more frictions than a banker who has a very, very safe balance sheet. It's sort of, we think, is a natural assumption, but it will be important in the model. Now, this is, the constraint is obviously time varying, and it's forward-looking. It's forward-looking because, you know, the incentives to default depend on what the bank thinks, what the banker thinks it will make in the future. And another important aspect of feature of the, of the model is that the banker doesn't just use the household discount factor to value payoffs. Um, it uses an augmented version of that, which takes into account the value of net worth for the banker. Okay, so if the banker is gonna exit, probability one minus sigma, that is just one, because it'll just pay the uh, net worth to the household, but with probability sigma, if the banker continues, that value of an, a unit of net worth is larger than one, um, uh, because the banker may be constrained in the future, and that also has some time variation in it. Um, so that, that's what kind of comes from the constraint, um, and that, that's all I'll say about the bankers. Now, when the constraint is not binding, 
we are in the financial stability region and the bankers fully arbitrage away this uh, spread between risky capital returned RK and the risk-free rate R. So to a first order, these two objects are equal. Credit spreads are low uh, when the economy is far away from the constraint and the dynamics sort of resemble a standard frictionless RBC model. Now, when, on the contrary, when the constraint is binding, uh, we say we are in a financial instability region. Here, this constraint now holds with equality, so the amount of risky lending is constrained by how much net worth uh, bankers have in the aggregate. Um, so, so then the responses of the economy reflect the nonlinear financial accelerator effect, which is that imagine that there's a decline in aggregate net worth, this um, tightens constraints, banks are forced uh, into uh, um, fire sales, which depresses the price of capital, which depresses net worth further, okay? Because the price of capital is an important determinant of this return here, okay? Yes, please. The rate, the rate between the risky capital and um, the so government. Yeah. Like, uh, the bank will give a benchmark. Yeah. Over yeah. No, in this model we don't have that. But there are, there are m modest elaborations of this model in which you could have that. In, in the Gerdler Kiyotaki handbook chapter, for example, you have that. Because there's a... That paper introduces a liquidity problem, so it creates um, um, uh, a need for liquidity in some banks and a, a surplus of liquidity in others, and there's an interbank market in which that gets resolved, and then you have a spread in the interbank market as well. But here we, we kind of abstract from that, but, but it has been, I think, I think there's, there's versions of this in which that happens. Yeah. This is our definition. Uh, we think it's natural because uh, this, is, um, this is when the financial sector is constrained. But uh, I agree, it's a definition. You would have other definitions. Now, in this model, it will be the case in general that when you are in this region, things are more volatile, spreads shoot up, and, and there are fire sales and so on. So in that sense, observationally, I think. In this model, there are always shocks. Sometimes large, sometimes small, sometimes in between. But there are always shocks. When you are in the financial instability region, any shock, big or small, has much bigger effects. Any shock has bigger effects. We have, um, we have uh, TFP, capital quality, and shock to the interest rate, thanks. No, a negative shock leads to fire sales. But if you are against the constraint, any shock has bigger effects. A positive shock also gets amplified because this, this whole thing is going to operate in reverse. So this feedback loop is going to go in reverse. Yeah, yeah. 
Higher sales are on the downside, higher volatility on the downside and on the upside, yeah, yeah. Um, here, because bankers are up against the constraint, they can't arbitrage. They would like to, but they can't because they cannot expand credit beyond um, um, deposits beyond what the constraint allows them. So there's this spread that opens up uh, between the, the risky rate and the safe rate. Okay, and we, to kind of capture this, we need to compute a fully nonlinear solution and so on. Uh, okay, so now going, going on to construct R double star, uh, like I said before, if we are in the unconstrained region, we start increasing R such that the constraint just starts to bind. Okay, and the same but vice versa when we are in the constrained region. So R double star is really a threshold here. It's the rate below which you are sure that you will remain in the financial stability uh, regime. And given this definition, the relevant variable like we were discussing before is a financial stability rate gap, R double star minus R, which this depends, which depends on the evolution of the other state variables in the model, like leverage or like the share of risky assets in the banker's portfolio. Okay, so this is, I think this illustrates some of the things we were just discussing. These are plots of the, uh, some key uh, endogenous variables as a function of two key state variables. Uh, the asset quality uh, in, bankers of the, in banker's balance sheets and the amount of bank debt. So when bank debt goes up or when asset quality goes down, you kind of get closer to the financial stability region. And then once you enter the financial uh, instability region, and this is reflected in the, in, as the multiplier on the leverage constraint turning positive, these things start to decline non-linearly. So this is much more steep here in this region than in the unconstrained region, which is really when, where these, these kind of policy functions are relatively flat. So this is what I meant. Here, things are steep. That's all. What happens with the financial stability rate gap? Well, in the uh, unconstrained region, this is positive. As, as you get closer to the constrained region, at the edge, this is zero. And when you cross over into the um, constrained region, this goes negative. R double star is below R because you are in the constrained region. Okay. Now we have a few exercises to kind of uh, show that the model has plausible empirical. Can you see it again? Oh. It's just the Lagrange multiplier on the leverage constraint. We call this we call it mu. One realistic feature of the model is, is the predicted distribution of the credit spread. So we look at what the model implies for this relative to the, to the data. And in the data, we use the gilchrist zakrashek uh, credit spread. So you kind of see a long fat tail, a long right tail. So the credit spread has occasional large spikes, both in the model and in the data. So this is because much of the time you are in the unconstrained region, spreads are kind of low, but then when you're in the constrained region, the multiplier uh, becomes positive, there's no arbitrage is prevented, and so uh, this shoots up. Also, the relationship between spreads and activity is realistic. So in the data, if you look at the relation between GDP and spreads, you see that there's a much tighter negative relation when the spread is high relative to its mean compared to when it's low, and the model can also reproduce this fact, again, because of this higher volatility in the constrained uh, region. And now let me emphasize uh, the dynamics of uh, R double star, and this is something that we, um, is one of the key points we want to make. So we do the following experiment. We consider a decrease in the process, in the real rate process. So it has, uh, it's a 2% at steady state, it declines. This is a persistent process as in the data. So what happens to the financial stability rate gap R double star? Okay, so first it goes up, okay, because you know, R star fell and R double star is kind of sluggish, so initially, the gap um, increases, but over time, the gap falls and ends up being smaller than when it was in the beginning. Okay, and this happens because there's a buildup of risk that results from this increase in the rate. And this, you know, the safe rate is low, this induces bankers to switch away from safe assets and into risky assets, so their balance sheets turn riskier. This puts the economy closer to the, to the uh, uh, financial constraint region because agents, um, agency frictions are larger for when, when bankers' balance sheets are riskier. And so the ratio of actual to maximum leverage 
it falls initially, but eventually goes up above its initial point. So again, they get closer to the constraint region. Um, so this, this is, um, and to just sort of illustrate the implications of that, we do a simple experiment. We give the economy the same shock, but in these two different states. In the, re in the, in the green dot, the, the economy is in a financially robust state, and the red dot, it's in a financially fragile state. And it's close to the constraint. And the same size shock, exactly the same shock, has much bigger effects when it hits the economy in the red dot, in the financially fragile state. Much larger declines in investment, much bigger increase in credit spreads, and so on. Um, I'm going to skip this because it's just a, sort of an elaboration of, of, of the same point, and I'll move on to, with just five minutes, the empirical part um, um, on, on measuring our double star. And so, and the, the idea behind this is the following. So in principle, in the model, if you know, if you know the state variables of the model, uh, you, you know R double star, okay? So in the model, you can just do that. Now, in the data, this is probably challenging because a lot of these state variables are hard to measure. So we kind of um, uh, take an alternative approach, which is um, to use a variable that is a good, we think, is a good proxy for the proximity to the constraint. And this variable is the credit spread. In the, in the model, this is a very correlated with the degree of constraint. So you can kind of sort of see this here. The top plot is the spread. The bottom plot is the multiplier and the constraint. The model, the spread really shoots up when you are up against the constraint. Now, the proximity, you know, the degree of constraints is, uh, uh, and the R double star gap is very correlated with the spread especially in the financially constrained regime. In the unconstrained regime, the relation is, is much looser. And our empirical um, uh, procedure to, to kind of takes that into account. So we do the following. We, take, we run regressions of R double star gap in the model on uh, a measure of credit spreads. Deviations, this, this spread is just the deviation of the spread in a given period relative to when you first entered that regime, okay? So we do that for both in both the financially constrained and the unconstrained regime. And we sort of get this, these two coefficients, okay? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna use these coefficients, these are the mappings between spreads and our gap in the model, and apply those to the data. That's sort of the idea, okay? And one thing that you notice here is that this relationship is much tighter in the constrained regime than in the unconstrained regime. And that is sort of reflected in these coefficients and in the standard errors, and you know, if you look at, we, we evaluate this procedure by, by saying, okay, let's apply it to the model generated data. Okay, we take the true R gap versus the predicted R gap using these regressions. And we see how well we do, and we find that we do pretty well, especially in the constrained regimes. Here are, here are the shaded areas. In the unconstrained regimes, we don't do as well, uh, and this is reflected because, you know, the relationship is looser, so you're, there's more ignorance on uh, what the true R gap is, and this bigger ignorance is reflected in these wider bands, uh, okay? So now the last step is, uh, you know, we have a relationship between spreads and R gap in the constrained regime, another one in the unconstrained regime. If we wanna go to the data, we need one more thing, which is to know what are constrained regimes in the data and unconstrained regimes. And here, again, we use a sort of heuristic rule that we verify works well in the model, which essentially uh, relies on identifying constrained regions as regions we have very volatile spreads um, and begin with spreads rising and finish with, with spreads declining. Okay, and here we use the 85 uh, quart quantile um, of all changes in credit spreads uh, because we found that this is, this is um, uh, a reasonable, this, this works well in the model. And this just kind of shows that the, this criterion is pretty effective at, at identifying constrained regions in the model. So then we go to the data and do the same. Okay, this is the GC credit spread in the data. We find uh, a number of constrained regions uh, here uh, in red. And those are all pretty identifiable. You know, the GFC, the dot com, COVID, uh, the China scare here, uh, and so on. So now we have the constraint and constraint regions, and we have the mapping in each, so we can construct our double star in the data. And, uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm done here, thank you. The green line is our double star. Uh, the 
the blue is the real Fed funds rate. So usually the um, Fed funds rate is below, so R double star is above the Fed funds rate. Sometimes R double star falls, and it falls so much that it falls below R, R, the real Fed funds rate, then you are in a constrained region. And here we sort of show, we zoom in on a couple of episodes to sort of show that the Fed effectively tracked um, the decline in R double star. So you see this in the uh, LTCM crisis, you kind of see the, um, the decline in the Fed funds rate kind of tracking how much R double star declined, um, which is not baked in the case, it doesn't happen by construction, it just turns out to happen. And kind of the same in the GFC, although here of course you hit the ZLB, so R double star actually went quite a bit below uh, the interest rate. And that's it. We introduced a new concept, R double star, the threshold rate above which uh, financial instability may arise. Uh, this enables us to translate financial vulnerabilities onto the policy rate space. And thank you very much for your attention. So thanks a lot for, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be in my first uh, CBER conference. So this, uh, this is a project uh, with, uh, with Len Ray on, uh, on financial cycles with heterogeneous intermediaries. And, and basically the idea is, is to pick up on, on this notion that is an old notion that uh, uh, crises are often uh, credit booms that, that eventually go bust, right? So it's, it goes back to Minsky, Kindleberger, there's, there's a lot of, of, of literature on that. But uh, 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 more recently there's been a, another literature saying, well, you know, it's not always that credit booms go um, go, go bust, uh, there's uh, good booms and bad booms, and also uh, Krishnamurti and Moore have a paper where they say, well, yes, if we see booms uh, where uh, the, the credit spreads are, are very low, then that's, that's very likely to forecast a crisis, uh, but that might not be the case uh, when, when the, the credit spreads are not that low. And so we'll, the microfinance literature before has focused a lot on amplification, uh, uh, but, but less on the boom phase. So now we start to see more papers coming out trying to, to raise this point of financial instability growing in the periods of calm. Um, but at the point where we started this project, there was not a lot yet. So we think that it's important to understand this risk buildup phase um, and the, uh, the link then to, between monetary policy and financial stability. And we're also gonna focus uh, on, on what we are, I'm gonna call here the cross-sectional concentration of risks if that happens in certain of these booms, right? So there's, uh, we think that this creates challenges for macro policies, and so that's, that's where we started this project. And so, what does the paper do? So first, we're going we're to mostly present a dynamic macro model with financial intermediaries that are going to be heterogeneous in risk taking. Okay, so they are not going to behave uh, the same uh, before the crisis and, and even during a crisis, and so we want to we want to investigate that. So, one of the good things of this is that we're going to have a financial sector block that you can you can kind of pre-solve in partial equilibrium. This creates kind of a, 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 a function of investment as a function of the cost of funds, and you could take allow us jointly uh, uh, the the liquidity of financial stability, generate standard variations. Combining panel data um, on financial intermediaries and, and theoretical macro models. So, uh, we have another paper where we started doing that, but we think that, that in the future this is kind of where, where the literature is going to go as well. Um, okay. Right, so ultimately we want a model that kind of generates the fluctuations that, that we observe, and so we, we think that it, it, our model does well in, in, in replic replicating these cross sectional patterns of leverage in terms of dispersion, but also skewness uh, as in the data. Okay, there's many, um, uh, you know, um, autopsies of booms that have uh, highlighted actually that, that the behavior of financial intermediaries uh, during the boom phase was very different, uh, including, uh, for example, uh, certain banks like the, like the Citigroup that increased their share of, of markets uh, significantly. So if someone, some, uh, intermediaries are getting share, it means that they're, they're growing much faster than the others and might even uh, reduce uh, the leverage. Uh, other might be even reducing their, their exposures. 
Okay, that, there's a huge literature on, on, on financial intermediation, monetary policy, financial frictions, and financial cycles. This is, I have very short time given the amount of things that we do in this paper, so I, I will only probably get to the partial equilibrium part. You'll have to trust me then that the results, they, they, they go on when, once we embed this in a general equilibrium model. But we think most of the action and the novelty of the paper is in the partial equilibrium, so in 20 minutes I'm gonna focus more on it. Okay, so the, what do we do here? We, I think we present a novel channel re relying on competition and selection. So competition for funds and assets is gonna generate these non-monotonic uh, selection and composition effects. So in that sense, in the boom phase, under certain conditions that I will show, uh, conservative intermediaries, they might be priced out as the balance sheet of risk takers grow. So the risk takers, they start getting, gaining a lot of leverage, they, they, they buy the assets, the price goes up, and if you're a conservative uh, investor looking at the, the housing market in the US before the crisis, you might say, well, uh, I, I, this is too risky for me, uh, but, but it's clearly not risky for many agents who are, who are going all in on this, okay? So we want, we want this type of, of action happening in the cross-section, okay? What we show also in the results is that these trade-offs are uh, mostly there when interest rates are, are low, right? And uh, I'm gonna show you that this is because uh, the elasticity of leverage of these risk takers is actually gonna be much larger when interest rates are low, right? And so uh, a, a change in interest rate at that point is gonna lead to a much larger increase in the asset purchases of, the, of these risky intermediaries, and, and so it's more likely that they, they end up pricing out, right? So even though the cost of funds goes down, some conservative intermediaries actually reduce their, their exposure because the, the price of the assets is also going up a lot. Okay, so basically this channel is gonna then affect aggregate risk taking, financial stability, and, and risk free. Okay, so some stylized facts in the cross section that I think are important to mention is that if you take a very basic uh, uh, cross section of, of leverage, uh, here we use the bank scope data, and you just plot uh, some, some scatter bin plots over asset deciles and equity deciles, you see that larger banks, if you measure by, ban or intermediaries, if you measure by balance sheet size, they are indeed much more levered, uh, but this is coming through mostly through leverage itself because when you do it by uh, net worth, well, um, book value of net worth, you, you don't see much action going on there, right? So I'm not saying again, it's important to notice what I'm saying. I'm not saying that net worth does not matter for an individual bank over its life cycle. I'm saying that the choices that uh, uh, these banks intermediaries make uh, seem to dominate in the cross section uh, the differences in leverage, right? So a small bank can be highly levered if it wants to, and uh, a large bank can be not as much uh, levered if it doesn't want to. Over its life cycle, you have your risk profile, right? So if you have more net worth or less net worth, that's gonna matter. But here, uh, we're gonna focus uh, um, entirely on this uh, um, leverage heterogeneity coming from different risk taking, okay? So what happens, one thing that started as well this project, we decided to kind of, let's see what has been happening with leverage if you, uh, if you uh, look at the quantile of leverage. And we do this by asset weighted because we want large and, we wanted to see large and uh, highly levered institutions uh, but a uh, similar graph occurs if you just do it by leverage and we have it on the paper with, without the asset weight. And so here we started in, the, in our sample, we just uh, normalized the leverage of every quantile to 100, right? And so there's no reason why these lines wouldn't cross. Right? We're just normalizing every quantile to 100. All this is saying that the highly leveraged quantiles are the ones that increase the leverage the most in the build up to the crisis, while uh, those that are uh, below the, the a certain threshold, like 90 seconds or, or below, they all actually went down in leverage compared to what, uh, what they, they, they are here, okay? So this again is descriptive. Uh, we are not, we are just looking at the quantiles, not individual banks, so we have some entry in the sample that leads to this fall, but you can trust me that a lot of these, a lot of banks actually decreased their exposure in the build-up to the crisis. Uh, but some increased it massively. Okay, so it's, it's quite remarkable that we find it at least that for every one of these quantiles, you almost see the pecking order remaining uh, in the build-up to the crisis. Okay, so interesting. So we'd say, okay, let's see if this kind of links uh, uh, with the, with the uh, if you can link this to, to the Fed funds rate, because we thought, okay, maybe this, this is important. And so we run very simple regressions again I'm not making any causal statements, it's just trying to understand the patterns in the data. 
uh, we run simple regressions to investigate this link between leverage and the Fed funds rate. And okay, what we're going to do, we're going to take uh, uh, any institution and time fixed effects for the aggregate, uh, individual intermediary fixed effects, and let's see what does it do uh, uh, when the Fed funds rate changes if this uh, is, is a lot, lot different depending on the quantile that I'm looking at, right? So if I'm in the top fifth uh, quantile, then I have this interaction term. And if this beta 3 is positive, then it means that I have a, a higher elasticity of, of leverage to, or, or higher correlation, if you want, of my leverage uh, with the Fed funds rate compared to the other, okay? And so we do this for a number of percentiles, uh, both for uh, here, the top X of, of leverage and also of net worth. And for net worth, sorry for the graph, it should be better uh, scaled, but you don't see much, but uh, um, for, for, for uh, the quantiles of leverage, right? You, you see this exactly like that. So those that were highly levered are also the ones that react more uh, to the Fed funds rate, right? Which is kind of not, not super surprising, but it's still an important feature that we're going to explore. Okay. So we do a lot of stuff. I, I don't have time to talk about, uh, but, but to sum up the main takeaways, uh, we see strong cross-sectional heterogeneity in leverage dynamics by leverage quantiles. We don't see it by equity net worth quantiles. Again, in the cross-section, right? So uh, not uh, for, for each individual uh, bank. Um, and then the, the, the pre-crisis rise in leverage was really concentrated in the highly levered institutions. If you remember these quantiles, they were all above 90, the 90th, right? So, so these are really uh, a very high concentration. And we find a strong negative correlation uh, between the leverage and the Fed funds rate for uh, the more leverage institutions, but not so much for the rest. Okay, so um, so these are the kind of the, the, the base facts that we, we wanted to, to have in our model. And so we basically have this model with, with intermediaries that are going to be uh, facing uh, possible default and limited liability. Uh, so they're risk neutral when they face heterogeneous value at risk constraints. So, so they're going to collect deposits that some net worth they're going to collect deposits from households. They're going to invest in risky capital, or they can invest also in a, in a safe uh, storage technology. Uh, so that's going to be endogenous to their portfolio. Um, and, but to, to keep things simple, and we wanted really to highlight that we are not, uh, we're not uh, competing. It's just a completely uh, complementary to the network channel. We're going to uh, make it some assumptions so that the network is going to be not moving over the, the cycle. Uh, and so these, these intermediaries are going to just live for two periods, be optimized for the next period. Then they consume whatever they have left, if they have left anything, and then the new generation is born with the same equity. Right? So it's just a, a, a little trick to keep the network fixed. Uh, you could also have capital injections uh, getting from, from the households if you want, but we, we prefer to do that. Okay, and it's important for us that they can default, right? So for us, financial stability, like the discussion in the previous paper, is, is a very multi-dimensional concept, and once you start having heterogeneity and default, it's like, what is financial stability, right? So there's many ways to define it. We have a couple of definitions that map into a couple of measures, but here, uh, I'm just gonna be a bit loose about it. <laughs> so hopefully, you don't uh, attack me for it, but uh, please check out the paper, because we have a little discussion on this and, and how hard it is to actually have a, a financial stability definition that everybody gives, or that everybody thinks it's the one. Uh, let's put it like that. Okay, households are super standard in the general equilibrium part. Uh, they can invest, uh, uh, in the, they, they can save in deposits uh, and sorry, technology. For, for uh, simplicity and off equilibria uh, uh, paths, we, we assume that they cannot invest directly in risky projects. But remember, they are risk averse. The banks have, are risk neutral. They have limited liability. So it's, it's, it would need the entire banking sector to be completely constrained, uh, which does not happen in our model because we have a small fraction of, of, of banks that are always unconstrained. So, um, but, but they are infinitely small, so they cannot uh, absorb the whole market. Okay, so then we have an official sector where the government uh, can step in and tax the households to guarantee deposits uh, and the monetary authority that provides wholesale funding that we're gonna just think of affecting the average cost of funds. So anything that I'm gonna say about monetary policy if you're thinking about a shock to the cost of funds, it should have similar effects. It's all about the cost of funds, right? So we don't have any uh, new Keynesian uh, aspects of monetary policy that could also enter uh, this mechanism. Here is, is purely, let's see what happens when the cost of funds change, what happens in the financial sector, right? What's going on there? Okay, so 
So really, this, at the center of the model are these financial intermediaries. Like I said, this two-period OAG structure. We're going to shut down the network channel by saying that they're born with a constant endowment. Um, I, I mean, I mean we, can, we can talk later if anyone is interested in what I think would happen if you, if you had a uh, time-varying network, and I think many interesting things would happen. But here, we're, we're uh, just, just fixing it for, for highlighting the mechanism on the cost of funds and the cross-sectional competition for assets. Okay, so when they're young, they, they're going to invest, say, in the capital stock uh, using equity and possibly deposits. This is going to be a decision that they, 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 they are going to take at some interest rate RTD, that is an equilibrium object. And so when they're old, they're going to consume net worth and die. So here in the partial equilibrium part is an input, right, given an RTD. In the general equilibrium part, the, 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 the financial sector uh, has a demand for deposits and the households have supply for deposits and this is the price that clears the market. So the price is actually the stock issue or the No, no, okay, I, I, that's a good, that's a good point. I'm, I will come back to that in a couple of slides, but that's very important, yeah. Here, no, but in reality probably there is some extent to that, uh, but to the extent that the they are not perfectly priced. We would still find some of these uh, things that we're saying. And if you look at the pre-crisis periods, we've, it's hard to, 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 to argue that the, the spreads across institutions were relatively small. Um, but you know, uh, that's, that's something that we're assuming here that, that could be a change in the future. Okay, so again, they're risk neutral. They face limited liability and are subject to a value at risk constraint. What is that? It's just we're going to constrain the maximal probability of incurring losses to some parameter alpha i, uh, and there's going to be a distribution of this. Okay. So, uh, so what is this value at risk constraint? So we're going to index these intermediaries by it, and you can think of it of different ways, right? So uh, you can think of it as different implementation of regulatory constraints. So basically, if I have a better compliance department, Maybe I navigate uh, regulation better than, than someone else, and, and, and so I can leverage a bit more than, than them or, or take a more risky position than them. Uh, but you can also think of it as maybe this, you know, the, the, the owners of certain financial institutions, they, 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 they want that institution to take a risky profile, and others want a safer profile. So it could be from, from, from that. But again, we're, we're not microfounding this. Uh, here, we're just taking it for, for granted as an input, and, and you can look at it in different ways as choices of, of uh, the owners of the institution or, or different implementation of regulatory constraints. We have some anecdotal uh, stories about different implementation of regulatory constraints, and we also have a paper where we, we, we estimate this distribution uh, from the cross-section, uh, if, you're, if you're interested, but I have no time to talk about it. So I'm going to just skip uh, to, to the role of the frictions here. There are going to be two important frictions. So uh, the first one is going to be the interaction of limited liability with different probabilities of default, right? So this is uh, once you start having limited liability and, and possible probabilities of default, you get option values of default. And so the, my willingness to invest in a risky asset is different from someone else my, uh, because we have different option values of default, right? So if uh, I'm very safe, I don't have any option value of default, I'm not so willing to pay for a risky asset as someone who has already uh, a riskier profile, right? So this kind of leads to a pecking order where the most risky one is the most, has the highest willingness to pay uh, and the safest one has the least willingness to pay for, for risky assets. Okay, but uh, the limited liability generates this risk shifting uh, motive uh, for investing. Okay, and then we go back to the question. We're gonna have deposit guarantees here uh, so deposits do not discriminate based on intermediary default risk, right? And again, uh, this is something that, that perhaps could, could be improved in the future, but there is enough evidence to say that uh, it, it doesn't seem that there was a lot of cross-sectional distribution in, this, in these rates again, uh, whether it's because people internalize that some of these things will be bailed out uh, or not, but even in money markets, uh, now it's slightly different, but in, in certain pre-crisis, um, these this, this spreads were low. Okay, so again, uh, this is mostly also for, simp for us to be able to solve the model. Uh, we're, we're just going to focus on, on the asset side here. Yeah, please. No, no, this is a natural consequence of the VAR. 
once once you allow it to default, right? If you have a VAR that doesn't that, that says you can your 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 constraint goes up where you cannot default, right? Then this doesn't work. But once you have a VAR heterogeneity, you're going to have risk shifting. And what I'm saying here is that once you have heterogeneity in that, you have this pecking order in the willingness to pay for assets. Yeah. Okay. So whenever uh, uh, the the risk rate of return on capital is bigger than storage, which is almost the entirety of the state space. Uh, because of limited liability, it might not be for certain, but we, for the most part there is. Then there's going to be, uh, we, we show that there can only be three business models, and, there's this spec and they're, they're, they're sorted by their alphas or their value at risk parameters. Okay, so if you're, uh, ex if you're uh, really unable to take much risk, you, you, you might not even be able to, to, to buy any risk assets, so you just invest in storage. Uh, uh, if you are of a low alpha, well, you are going to enter the market for risky projects, but you're not going to lever. Um, and uh, what is the more standard one is what we call the risky business model. You enter this market for risky projects, and you leverage up to your value risk constraint, right? So we show that once there is no, uh, once you have this heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneity and they're all infinitely small, you can have these bang-bang solutions where when you invest, you go up to your constraint because you're not affecting the prices. Uh, on the margin, so, so in the aggregate you would, of course, once you uh, do the market clearing, but as an individual in your optimization, then you go up to the constraint, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we have a cutoff, and then everyone above that cutoff uh, is, is levered and up to, the, up to their constraint. No, they're not going to be larger, uh, but uh, it's just an interval, right? Like, uh, this goes, if you start at zero up to alpha upper bar, right? This goes from zero to alpha n, this goes from the other alpha to alpha l, and alpha l to the alpha upper bar, right? So, uh, yeah. Excuse me? The middle group is not levered. They just in invest their network. So basically, if, if I'm too, if, if I cannot take much risk, I can only, I, I can buy this storage or I can buy these uh, uh, assets, but I cannot, uh, but without having the risk of default, right? I can still buy these risky assets with my net worth and I'm not defaulting because I have no liabilities, right? So, so it happens that there are some, some people that do this. No, these ones, no. I mean, we are mostly interested in this group, basically. I think this is the most relevant group. And this, 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 you know, uh, you can make assumptions to make them all non-participants if you want, and you get rid of the middle group. But. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. We kind of think of this as the most important part of, of the thing, oh, yeah. and and so then, the yeah, the action is on the top, and and uh, you know, for some, yeah, some, when we look at the cross-sectional data, we kind of look at also at, at this. I mean, yeah, we don't want to think like, I mean, yes, it could be, but we don't, we, we don't want to think like that. If anything, I would say that someone moving from here to here would be, say, uh, a financial institution closing down a particular uh, asset class that they don't want to invest, right? So, so they would say, no, I don't want to go to this asset class, so I kind of show it, shut it down because it's too risky for me. But we don't want to think of it exactly as banks just saying, no, I'm going to go from, uh, you know, buying deposits to not having deposits. This seems too extreme for us. So we like to think of this as, as, as more like, yes, I, I remove my exposure from this asset class because it's um, too risky and I don't think it's profitable um, over an actual bank saying I, I remove my leverage. No, we are we are now. No, no. I absolutely agree that it's also important, and now we are actually working on that. Actually, mostly on the risk of currency mismatch between I mean the, between liabilities and assets, 
but but yeah, it's it's already this is this is the mechanism I want to focus on today. Uh, and indeed, we are kind of simplifying the liability side here, like uh, the deposit guarantees, they just shut everything down on the liability side. So I, I take that point, for sure. But we still think that, especially in the pre-crisis, to understand what is going on uh, with this, uh, you know, a negative correlation of leverage across agents, uh, you, need, you need to think about this competition for assets. Uh, Sure, I, I would. I, I would need to. I, I, I mean, again, okay. I, I, we, I have not checked that exactly. Uh, we could define a threshold and then look in that threshold. Uh, but a lot of the action holds when you do this asset weighted stuff, and so the, you're kind of sorting them also by by size uh, and economic importance. Um, okay. But, uh, so, so, so we have these three business models. So. One important thing is that there's going to be this intensive margin. So uh, for any uh, intermediary, we get this, uh, uh, when, the, when the, the valid risk constraint binds, you can get a very simple uh, expression for its leverage, which is a function of the, the cost of funds and also uh, its, its riskiness, right? So it's this here, it's like, a, I don't have much time to talk about it, but it, the, 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 this R alpha is kind of the return that, uh, that you get uh, with, at, with at least probability alpha. Okay, so if my alpha is very low, then I cannot invest uh, much, but if my alpha is very light, I then invest. So, so the properties that I want you to focus on is that conditional on this participation, conditional on being in this first group, uh, the in leverage is gonna be increasing in risk taking, decreasing in the cost of leverage, uh, increasing in expected returns, and, and decreasing in TFP volatility and idiosyncratic risk. So, so these are the properties that you would like to have. Okay, so uh, this is the kind of the cross section of that that uh, that uh, the, what it looks like. So it's we always get this convexity coming out of these uh, value risk constraints, um, and, and here we plot for three different interest rates, right? So in this graph, uh, there is some normal monotonicity here that I'm going to uh, focus on. But what I want to highlight is first this convexity. And also when you go from uh, low rates or, or high rates to low rates, you go from the blue line to the red line, you see that actually these agents here are less levered than these ones, even though they are both active, right? So the cost of funds went down, but these guys have increased the price of the asset so much that actually I'm, I'm, my constraint uh, here tightens, right? So, so the, the expected returns matters a lot as well for the constraint, okay? So again, uh, in the partial equilibrium, if you take the, uh, the, the financing cost is given, you can solve for this threshold uh, and the, the capital stock. So capital stock always goes up, so we don't have a reversal rate here, if you want. So you, your interest rates go down, capital stock goes up. But the cutoff, right, so which, what, what does this cutoff mean? It means the lower it is, the, the safer is the, the, the selection of, of uh, agents in this in this market, right? And the higher it is, only the risk takers are left. Right? So we have this U-shaped pattern, where if you're here and you reduce interest rates, then you actually get entry from safer intermediaries, right? So, and and here, if you get reduced interest rates, then you actually get exit uh, of these safer intermediaries, right? So, uh, on top of that, you have this this uh, distributional effects where the leverage of these guys actually goes down and this goes up. So, uh, the, the share not only goes up because these others are increasing leverage more, it goes also, uh, sorry, the financial instability goes up also because these other ones, they reduce their exposure, the safer ones. Okay, but uh, this is one of the basic measures of financial instability, it's just the selection that we have in the market, and we have like one is, which is asset weighted, right? So if you have the same agents in the market, but uh, the, the, the high alpha ones have larger, then that's gonna be more financial, I mean, we have a couple of measures, so, so I have no time. Um, but we, we show what, what this U-shape depends on, on the, the strength of this intensive versus extensive margin. Um, and, and, uh, and so when we go to ger general equilibrium, we just have the price that clears the market so from. So also de define a deposit supply curve, financial sector block defines, defines a deposit demand curve in equilibrium and also uh, the, up, the investment, right? So you put them together and you can solve, solve your model. Okay. So, um, so basically, uh, since I'm completely out of time, uh, we, we just, for simplicity, just want to look at the cost of funds uh, effect on, the, on this. So one deposit finance just 
affecting this cost of funds. So it affects the composition of the financial sector, aggregate risk taking and risk shifting. And credit booms due to the fall in the cost of funds are going to be associated with a, with a decrease in the risk premium and higher skewness of the cross-sectional distribution of leverage, like we're saying. So, and that is, that is this important trade-off, and in particular when rates are low. Okay, so we show that uh, you can also have a good boom. So if, if actually this increase in credit is driven by higher uh, expected returns and not by a fall in the cost of funds, then, then actually that, that's going to be a good boom. So the GDP expands, credit uh, uh, grows. Uh, we don't have much action in, in the risk premium. If anything, there's a marginal fall, but not much action, and, and financial stability improves, right? So this is kind of the good boom. Uh, driven by investment opportunities, bad booms driven by, by ultra low cost of funds. Okay, so uh, since again I'm out of time, I'm going to conclude. There's a lot of stuff I, I didn't have a chance to talk about in the paper if you're interested in this topic. So we think this is a, a new uh, tractable framework, or, or at least that you can take and, and embed it in other DSGEs um, that generates all this, this stuff that I've just talked about. So if you have any questions, uh, I'd love to take them as well. So I'm going to leave some time for that. Good morning, I'm Jacopo Bonchi. Thanks, uh, Mattias and Cristina, for having me. This is a, a joint paper with Salvatore Nistico from uh, Sapienza University of Rome. Let me start uh, with a brief uh, motivation about this paper. So, in the last years, central banks are even more concerned about the distributional aspects. And an important uh, economic phenomenon which can distort the distribution of wealth is uh, the bubble, a bubble in asset price. Let me clarify a bit uh, the theoretical definition of a bubble. Think about the value and asset price. It can be split in a fundamental value, so like the price of the, price of the share, the fundamental value is the expand, expect, expected discounted flow of future dividends. Uh, and there is also a bubbly component, so something completely unrelated to the fundamental. And in this literature, the literature of rational bubble, basically you can consider these two components like two different assets. And so the bubble is just, uh, in the model I will show you, a, a worthless asset. But there, it is priced positively because there is some kind of uh, coordination. So the idea is that uh, I have a bubble like a piece of paper I sell uh, to Albert and he buys this bubble because he expects to sell the bubble in the next period at an higher price. That's the idea behind the bubble. And of course uh, think about a real bubble, a bubble attached to stocks or to housing these assets are concentrated at different points of the wealth distribution. In this sense, a bubble can distort the original wealth distribution. In this paper, we will focus in particular on the distribution of wealth, and these are the main research questions we try to answer. So what are the implications of bubble-driven fluctuation for inequality of wealth and hence uh, consumption inequality, and in particular, we try to look at the optimal response of a central bank uh, concerned with distributional aspects. The idea is that, uh, let me clarify this point, of course we take uh, like a normative approach because central banks in reality, they don't care about distributional aspects in the sense that they don't target the distribution of wealth, uh, and they don't target financial instability. So we consider, uh, we take a normative approach. But the idea is that, think about an environment of very low interest rates, okay? A side effect of, of this environment can be the emergence of a bubble in asset price. And so the central bank could be interested in restoring the original distribution of, of wealth uh, affected by the bubble. That's the idea. In this sense, uh, we don't consider a central bank trying to affect the long-run distribution of wealth inequality, but just uh, a central bank concerned with uh, the uh, 
the temporary fluctuation in, in wealth inequality. That's the idea. And of course, for the central banks, uh, losses are symmetric. So also a decrease in wealth inequality from the original distribution of wealth is detrimental. Let me move to what we do in practice. We start from a benchmark. The benchmark is this paper by Jordi Galli, 2021 on AJ Macro. This is uh, a paper to introduce uh, asset bubbles uh, in a very peculiar framework, a perpetual youth model. So for those who are not familiar with this model, me, Albert, uh, Nuno, we have different ages, but the same probability to die in each period. That's the idea behind a perpetual youth model. We start from this framework, but our main goal is to derive the optimal monetary policy. And so we have to add some additional ingredients. We start from this continuous asset market participation. In the Galiz models, we have finitely live agents, of course, but we want to use an infinite horizon model. So we try to reinterpret the perpetual youth structure through this continuous asset market participation. And I will explain you what we do in practice. Then in the Galiz model, there is an ad hoc wage schedule. Instead, we want a fully microfounded model, and so we introduce an endogenous labor supply, and of course, we need to neutralize the monopolistic distortion and so we have an efficient balance growth path to derive the optimal monetary policy. At the end, we have some results. Some results are like, uh, I mean, instrumental to the derivation of a, welfare, a quadratic welfare-based loss function. And of course, in this function, there is also some role for wealth inequality. But by introducing these additional ingredients, we get some... Uh, we get different results from the original Jordi's paper. And of course, at the end, we draw some normative implication after deriving a, a welfare-based loss function. So let me go to the detail. The idea is that we want to introduce rational bubbles in tank model. Because of this continuous asset market participation, we have a tractable tank model. And, uh, at the end, we introduce rational bubbles in infinite horizon model in a way different from this paper. In these papers, uh, the idea is to use uh, the borrowing constraint to introduce uh, uh, bubbles uh, in infinite horizon models. And now I would uh, emphasize uh, the structure of the model, and in particular, uh, I would uh, describe the model through a graph. We start from uh, a problem. So most of the literature focuses on the study of rational bubble in OLG perpetual youth model. Why did they do that? Basically, the problem is that uh, in an, think about the bubble and the process I described earlier. I need uh, a seller like Albert for the bubble. But in an infinite horizon model, there is no Albert. I am. Uh, just the representative agent. But what happens like in an OLG model uh, like the Galiz one? Of course, I can pass the bubble through the next generation. But this is just uh, an OLG model. In this model, you, you, when you, you were born, you are employed, you can become retired, and at some point, both employed and retired can die. So, truth dying, basically, I and uh, the, in this model, the idea is that I can pass the bubble to the next generation. And in this way, I, see, I don't have the problem of transversality condition. Instead, uh, I need the transversality condition in an infinite horizon model. And we start from the uh, a previous paper by Salvatore. And so we try to reinterpret this kind of structure through a discontinuous asset market participation. So me and Albert, I am a market participant, and with some probability I can keep this status in the financial market, but with some 
probability I get out of the financial market. Albert is hand to mouth, rule of thumb, with some probability he can keep this status, otherwise he can become market participants. And the idea is that in this kind of framework, uh, I can pass the bubble to the newcomers, so the end to mouth becoming market participants. And this is equivalent to the idea I pass the bubble to the next generation in an OLG model. In this way, I can circumvent the, prob the problem of transversality condition in an infinite horizon model. Of course, this is a problem for the introduction of an asset bubble. And we augment this structure from the previous paper by Nistico with basically another status, employed and unemployed. So this is a simplifying assumption. Only when you are market participants with some probability, you can become unemployed. Then when you become end to mouth, you keep your status uh, into the labor market, then when you become again market participants, all the unemployed become also employed. This is a simplified assumption for tractability reasons. So, sorry? Yes, well, because the idea is that uh, I need the, the, this continuous asset market participation to circumvent the problem of transversality condition. No, well, but I, I need the, this assumption because otherwise I cannot uh, introduce bubble in this kind of framework. But it is equivalent, let me to this uh, assumption in Gali, so the absorbing state of retirement. Yes, but you need also, uh, the thing is that when you become market participants, at the beginning you are employed, but you know with some probability you will become unemployed, and so you had the incentive to save a lot because of this probability to get unemployed, and so at the end, your real rate goes, the real rate, sorry, goes below the economic growth rate, and this is the condition for the existence of the bubble. It is equivalent to this assumption, but with a different structure. So the idea is just to reinterpret this framework in an infinite horizon model with some kind of heterogeneity. But in principle, the idea is the same. And this is a formal result of our paper. So let me know if it is a bit more clear. Sorry? OK, perfect. Thank you. So let me just sum up. So we have different layers of heterogeneity, market participants and then to mouth, employed and unemployed and the, the most important feature of the model. Of course, uh, think about, I come in, so I become in this period uh, a market participant. I was previously uh, an end to mouth, so I am an incumbent. And in this framework, uh, at the beginning, uh, I have uh, a very low wealth stock. Instead, if I keep staying, uh, this is, sorry, I am a newcomer, sorry, the other way around. Instead, if I keep staying in the financial market for several periods, I am an incumbent and I am accumulating a Niger stock of wealth. So there is a difference in terms of wealth between incumbent and newcomers. You can think like the, uh, the rich people in terms of wealth, like the, the people at the top of the wealth distribution, and the poor one, the people now at the middle bottom of the distribution. You can think in this term. And this is the welfare relevant layer of heterogeneity. So bubble can affect the difference in terms of wealth between these two agents. Both are market participants, but with a different longevity into the financial market. And so the central bank suffers some losses in terms of work.
Then I need the JHH preferences uh, adapted to the balanced growth path to microfound uh, the labor supply. And at the end, this was, uh, of course, the demand side. The supply side is uh, almost standard, the new Keynesian. There is just uh, a probability for firms to exit uh, the market. Uh, and I need to introduce an employment subsidy unlike uh, the Galice paper. Then there is a government uh, and there is a welfare maximizing central bank. So let me move to some results. So we start from the balance growth path, and uh, in this case, we derive the conditions for the existence of the bubble. This is uh, the aggregate bubble in our case uh, at the balance growth path with uh, all these additional ingredients, and this is the aggregate bubble uh, in the case of Gali 2021. At the end, the conditions for the existence uh, are the same. So at the end, we need some kind of dynamic inefficiency, and this is pretty standard in this model. But the, di the main difference is that because of these terms, uh, the aggregate value of the bubble in the balanced growth path is smaller in our framework. So this is like the theoretical results we get uh, uh, by adding some additional ingredients to the Galiz paper. So at the end, uh, when you are market participants, of course, you know you will become uh, end to mouth at some point. You have a finite planning horizon, and this is so morphic uh, to finite leaves uh, like in Gali for the introduction of asset bubbles. But at the end, uh, compared to the Galiz model, we have uh, smaller aggregate bubbles, and this will be important for the effect of monetary policy on the value of the aggregate bubble. So this was the balance group path, and this is the linear model. Just a, a brief summary, this is the, fund, the, the linearized fundamental wealth. So you have a human wealth coming from the expected value of your future labor income, and you have uh, another component of fundamental wealth, uh, and this comes from the expected value of uh, uh, future dividends. You can invest in stocks from firms. Then this is the output gap, and as usual in the perpetual youth structure, basically you consume uh, a part, uh, a marginal propensity of your wealth. This is the bubbly wealth, and this is the fundamental one. This is the aggregate bubble dynamics, and this is the rule uh, I will uh, explain you in a moment of the aggregate bubble in the balance group path. But an important thing, there are like new and old bubbles in this model, because um, we are focusing on the heterogeneity in terms of wealth. So we want to study different bubbles according to the owner of the bubble. So the newcomers, uh, people entering now in the financial market, uh, they own the new bubble. Think about like uh, a real world counterpart, uh, an appreciation in the value of housing in the very new neighbor, or an appreciation in the value of uh, new stocks uh, issued in, into the financial market. Instead, uh, the incumbent, uh, those uh, who invested also in the previous period in the financial market, uh, they can invest uh, in an old bubble. So like the value of uh, houses in an old neighbor or the value of stock or uh, an, already, an already listed company in the financial market. Because we want to distinguish the owner of the bubble. Think about uh, in a real world, uh, housing is mostly concentrated uh, at the bottom uh, of the wealth inequality, at the middle bottom. So in distributional terms, instead stocks are concentrated at the top. In distributional terms, uh, you cannot have uh, the same effect on wealth inequality. And we want to mimic this kind of stuff with this uh, uh, simplifying uh, assumption. So the, there is... Uh, a, an old component of the aggregate bubble and the new component, and this is uh, the new Keynesian Phillips curve uh, 
with only these additional terms uh, due to the, uh, the finite planning horizon. Let me clarify this point. So the previous result uh, is the following one. The aggregate value of the bubble in the balanced growth path uh, is, is smaller compared to the Galiz model. So what happened? In this model, uh, the central bank can use the policy rate to affect the real rate uh, and then to mitigate the fluctuations in the bubble. The idea is that the real rate is like uh, the growth in the bubble price. So if I increase uh, the value of the bubble in the future, it has to reduce the current value of the bubble today. Of course, uh, this is uh, an assumption due to the, uh, the presence of rational bubble. But if this, uh, this is uh, the, aggregate, the, the aggregate bubble to output ratio in particular, because what is important is the value of the bubble in comparison with the size of the GDP of the economy. But if uh, this term is smaller in our framework, this means that uh, if the central bank wants to reduce the bubble fluctuation, the quantitative effect is smaller because this effect, the effect of the real rate on aggregate bubble fluctuation is proportional to the aggregate bubble in the balanced growth path. So the idea is that the policy rate uh, when we add some additional ingredients compared to Gali, it's not a very good tool, uh, even if uh, it can affect bubbly fluctuation to dampen them. That's the idea. And that's uh, our second result. So with endogenous labor supply, but also the other additional ingredients, there is a lower interest rate elasticity of uh, equilibrium rational bubbles. And also with endogenous labor supply, in this kind of model with JHH preferences, usually you have the indeterminacy of output gap. But when you introduce also this continuous asset market participation, you can solve uh, this problem. So now let me move. This was like uh, the theoretical part of the model. And then uh, with these additional ingredients, uh, we can derive uh, a welfare uh, uh, loss function, a quadratic one, the, of course, a lot of derivation in the appendix. Uh, let me focus on the economic meaning. Of course, uh, there are no cost push shocks in this model. So in principle, the divine coincidence would work. But now you have an additional term. This is like the consumption dispersion. So there are uh, difference uh, between the consumption of the incumbents uh, and the consumption of the newcomers. Those I called uh, the rich people in terms of wealth and the poor people in terms of wealth. And of course, uh, this consumption can be affected by fluctuation in the aggregate bubble. In this case, uh, incumbents uh, as uh, an increase, uh, experience an increase in their consumption. Instead, the newcomers uh, on the new bubble. So if there is a new bubble shock, uh, there is a reduction in this difference. Uh, and newcomers, uh, like people uh, at the bottom of the wealth inequality, they rely mostly on la labor income. So the effect of the fluctuation of fundamental wealth is higher for these uh, people. And so when you have an increase in fundamental wealth, uh, some fluctuation, you have a reduction in this uh, consumption gap, okay? But the main result is that uh, at the end, we have an endogenous policy trade-off. So on the one end, there is uh, inflation output gap stability. On the other end, there is the consumption dispersion. So despite uh, this is the standard environment in which the divine coincidence applies, uh, there is still an endogenous trade-off, and so the strict inflation targeting is not optimal. This is another result uh, we get. And so now let me move to the last part of the presentation. We study, of course, uh, discretion and commitment from an, uh, just an analytical uh, way. But at the end, we just focus on discretion because the theoretical in intuitions are the same. 
this is uh, the targeting rule in the case of discretion. So it is optimal for the central bank to trade off some fluctuation in uh, output gap and inflation with some fluctuation in consumption dispersion. That's uh, the innovation compared to the standard model. And now, and there is also, let me clarify, another point, another result. I already told you at the end, uh, the policy rate is not so effective in this uh, extended framework compared to Gali in dampening the bubbly fluctuation. So, for example, in this, uh, I forgot this, sorry, in this kind of model, you have a multiplicity of equilibria. So, in any case, you have a bubbless equilibrium and a bubbly one simultaneously. We focus in particular on the bubbles balance growth path because we consider it uh, a very good rep representation of reality. Usually in reality, you can think the bubble grows and some point it bursts. So it is like the value of the bubble in the balance growth path is zero. But when you assume a zero value of the aggregate bubble, at the end, this policy trade-off is more stringent. And the intuition is very simple. Let me just uh, get back to this equation. If this value is zero, the central bank cannot affect directly the bubble. So the, the idea is that if you, have, uh, if you have some fluctuation in one component of the bubble, the central bank has to react uh, by affect, affecting the fundamental wealth. For this reason, the policy trade-off is more stringent. So the idea is that, uh, and that's uh, I will show you in the last result, uh, when you have some kind of uh, bubbly shock around the bubbless balance growth path, so probably the most uh, realistic case, uh, the central bank uh, would compensate some fluctuation in this term by affecting uh, the fundamental wealth through uh, the real interest rate. Yes, you are right, but I think uh, it is, uh, of course, this is uh, a very precise case. Um, but for several reasons, we think uh, it is the more realistic one. Be for the reason I mentioned earlier, but also because uh, there is no consensus about uh, the way in which the central bank can affect the aggregate bubble. So when uh, you assume this is zero, you are taking like uh, an agnostic stance in the sense that you are assuming in principle the central bank uh, cannot affect directly the bubble, and there is some consensus among uh, central bankers about, about that. This is, uh, this is a bit conservative, uh, I agree, but uh, I think... Uh, Still an, an interesting result. I, I'm not denying that. Yes, yes, we think... Uh, we think, uh, well, of course, it is also more complicated to derive uh, analytical solutions uh, around the bubble balance growth path. But we think that any conclusion in this case strongly rely on, on the assumption that uh, there is some kind of effect from the monetary policy to the bubble fluctuation. And to some extent, this is a strong assumption because there is no consensus. Let me conclude with the last point. Uh, we studied, should if we studied the optimal discretionary policy around the bubbles balance growth path uh, with an old bubble shock, so like the shock uh, of the rich people in terms of wealth, uh, and uh, also the same case, but with a, a new bubble shock, so like the bubble of the poor people. And the last result is that the optimal response is different. When you have a bubble for the rich people, the central bank would accommodate the expansionary effect. Instead, when you have a new bubble, so a bubble of, sorry, this is a bubble of the rich people. So when, when you have a bubble of the poor people, 
in the first period the central bank would lean against the bubble. The idea is that uh, the central bank can affect only the fundamental wealth. So when you have uh, a bubble of the uh, rich people, think of this term, there are some capital gains for these uh, people, okay? And there is a boom in the economy coming from the bubble. The poor people benefit a lot from the, uh, the fluctuation in outcome. They, fan they benefit more than uh, the rich people. That's the reason why I accommodate. Instead, when the uh, poor people own the bubble, they directly benefit from some capital gains. Uh, so you would uh, uh, cancel, you would mitigate also the... Uh, the gains from an higher labor income. That's just the intuition, and uh, I finish. These are just, uh, there is just uh, a final slide to sum up. So there are some theoretical results coming from the additional assumptions uh, with respect to the Galiz model, and there are some uh, policy implications. Of course, uh, I mean, not so strong, but uh, I think in general there are some guidelines uh, if central banks care about the wealth inequality from bubbles, probably the policy rate is not the best instrument, for example. And not all bubbles are alike uh, in terms of the effect on wealth inequality. So you would tailor the intervention with respect to the specific type of bubble. Thanks. All right, I'm going to talk about um, investor sentiments and credit boom bust cycles and this is joint work with Eddie from the Bank of England and Danilo from the Bank of Spain. So if you sit in the financial stability department of a central bank you tend to worry a lot about credit to GDP ratios. Um, why do you do that? Because credit to GDP ratios tend to predict um, financial crisis. And why do you worry about credit to GDP ratios? Well, essentially because like credit and GDP are not perfectly correlated. So you have some movements in credit to GDP ratios over time. And this, like, I mean, it's a trivial fact. This is because like credit growth and GDP growth are not identical. So here I'm showing you this as the example of the US where I'm plotting as the blue line GDP growth year on year and as the red line, the growth in credit to the non-financial sector. And you see that you have sometimes, like during the 1980s, during the 1990 recession, and here during the um, dot-com bubble, where you have pretty close co-movement between credit growth and GDP growth. But then you have other times where like these series diverge, for example, here during the middle of the 1980s and in the run-up to the dot-com bubble. So, when you see this, you naturally start thinking about like what explains these fluctuations in credit to GDP growth uh, ratios. And one popular um, explanation is that this is somehow related to investor sentiments defined in some way. Um, and here I'm showing you one particular measure of investor sentiments that we're also going to employ in this paper. So the red line is again um, GDP, uh, credit growth, as I defined in the previous slide. The blue line in this paper, in, in this picture, is um, a noise bubble in stock prices. And this noise bubble is the component of stock prices that is driven by shocks that are unrelated to dividends. And you can see that there's some like periods, in particular during the 1970s, uh, here during the late 1980s, and um, during the later years, during the dot-com bubble and also during the financial crisis, where this noise bubble moves pretty closely with credit growth. So this brings me to the research question of our paper. We want to explain whether investor sentiment shocks, proxied in some way, can cause credit boom bust cycles. And like there's a pretty big literature on defining investor sentiment shocks in some ways, so we need to narrow this down. And so our definition of investor sentiment shocks are going to be noise shocks, like shocks to um, investor expectations about future dividends that fail to realize. And we borrow this identification procedure from some paper by uh, Forni, Gambetti, Lippi, and Sala that was published in the Economic Journal in 2017. And to give you a flavor of the kind of shocks that we will identify as noise shocks, 
we can think about the stock price crash in um, the late 1980s as a negative noise shock. Or you can think about the dot-com bubble in the late 1990s as an example of a positive noise shock. Now, once we have identified these noise shocks, we are going to use them as an external instrument in local projections to measure the causal impact of investor sentiment on credit to the non-financial sector. Why do we use local projections? The nice thing about local projections is that they are pretty flexible, so you can look at a broad array of time series, and you can also look at state-dependent results. And if you look at this whole financial accelerator literature, there's a lot of evidence that like, the propagation of financial shocks and investor sentiment shocks should be state-dependent. If you think, for example, about occasionally binding constraints or about the banking crisis, you will have that the propagation of shocks is different during times where these constraint binds and during times where these constraints don't bind. And in the end, we are going to rationalize our findings in a macrofinance model. So what are our main results? We find that indeed noise shocks do cause boom-bust cycles to credit to non-financial firms. In particular, a one standard deviation noise shock increases credit by a peak of around 1% after around three years. And this impact uh, reverses back to the um, mean after around 20 quarters. So you have an increase in credit that peaks after 10 quarters, and that impact mean reverts completely after 20 quarters. And this is in contrast to a shock that leads to dividend expectations that are realized, where you see a permanent effect. And we find that there's two main channels that are important. Like, if you think about like, financial intermediation, you could think that this um, noise shock either works through the banking sector, so it affects uh, bank balance sheets and it affects how much banks lend to the non-financial sector, or you could um, on the other hand, think that it uh, works more through the bond market. So it affects investor expectations and it affects like asset prices, credit spreads on the bond market and so on. Yes? Um, so in principle, um, you could think about uh, firms like borrowing more um, in response to noise shock, we are trying to take care of this by including some measure of the business cycle in our specifications, but um, indeed, yeah, you could think about credit demand playing a more important role. Yes? Uh, about the magnitude, so one percent increase in credit So um, this one standard deviation noise shock leads to an increase in credit of 1%. It leads to an increase in stock prices of around 5%. So I would say, if given that credit is sort of a, um, like it's a stock and it's a pretty slow moving aggregate, um, this 1% effect is pretty large compared to, like stocks are way more volatile than credit would be. Um, so given these relative changes, I think this is a pretty large effect. Also, if you look at like the impact on GDP, like this noise shock will have a transitory impact of GDP of around 0.4%. Um, All right, and if we look sort of at the state-dependent effects, like we can see that this impact on noise shocks on credit and real activity is larger during times of low credit spreads. So this is a bit against what we expect, and we're going to uh, talk about why this is later. Um, so during times of low financial distress, you have more amplification of like noise shocks in our model. And these times of low financial distress are, for example, the late 1970s and the 1990s and the early 2000s. Now, in terms of the literature, like a lot has been written about investor sentiments and credits and asset boom uh, bust cycles. So we try to place ourselves in between the literature on credit and asset price booms and expectations as drivers of asset price booms. And to be very narrow, we contribute to the literature on the effects of news shocks on financial aggregates. And our contribution is that we look not at news shocks, but more at the impact of noise shocks, like uh, at news shocks that fail to realize in the end. And we provide evidence how they work. All right. So if you think about like why noise shocks in the first place should affect credit, like, you can think about these two channels. There's this bank lending channel and this bond market channel. So if you, and like any kind of macro model would probably include both of these, but it's for the empirics useful to sort of tease them apart a bit. So if you look at the bank lending channel, 
like one thing that's important in many macrofinance models is that financial intermediary network um, determines uh, financial intermediaries lending. So if you have a positive noise shock that raises asset valuations, this will increase intermediaries network. And this will so then, um, by relaxing their financial constraint, allow them to expand their lending activities. And this is, for example, at the heart of the Gertrude Kiyotaki uh, and following papers are the Bruno Meyer and Sannikov type models. Now, if you think about the bond market channels, so this is a idea, yes. I mean, net worth can rise on, like, only because of a change in asset prices, right? So you have something that doesn't really affect how, like, think about the Gertrude Kiyotaki framework. Um, there you never have any dividend payouts of sorts, but you can have, yeah. mm -hmm. Um, so, the way we're going to identify these noise shocks is that we're going to be very narrow on the stock market. We're not saying that they more broadly cannot affect the economy in other ways, but we require that they never affect dividends. And dividends, um, you can think about firms' dividend policies as any kind of, like dividends, if you look at the data, are pretty smooth. So, you can have... Um, a lot of fluctuations in earnings that are not reflected in dividends. So dividends are, in some sense, a long-run measure of how well firms are doing. So in that sense, you can have um, effects of these noise shocks that are short-run, but do not affect sort of firms in the long run, if that makes sense. Yes. So it's indeed the case that like there's more and more firms that don't pay dividends. Like an alternative way to, would be to look at earnings or some smooth measure of earnings, and there you would actually get similar results. All right. In terms of the bond market channels, so this would work less through uh, bank net worth and work more through asset pricing. So the idea there is borrowed from this intermediary-based asset pricing literature. And this states that uh, bond market spreads, so credit spreads on the bond markets, reflect in some way the scarcity of financial intermediaries network. So if you have a positive noise shock to asset prices, this raises intermediaries network. And this would not like change sort of the amount of um, like bonds that these intermediaries network uh, are necessarily willing to give out, but it would change the pricing of these bonds. So it would change the credit spreads. Um, it would lower the cost of bond financing, which would then lead firms to issue more bonds, in a sense. So you have sort of a bank lending channel that would primarily operate through quantities, and you have a bond market channel where, like, the supply response would not be captured in quantities, but in prices, and you would get the quantity response from firms issuing more bonds. And, like, prominent papers that focus on this intermediary asset pricing channel are the He and Krishnamurti paper and the Adrian and Shin paper and the follow-up literature. So, if you look at these kind of channels, like from the bank lending channel, you would predict that uh, there's an increase in loans outstanding. You would also um, predict that there's a change in bank leverage or actually bank net worth. And if you look at the bond market channel, you would expect an increase in bonds outstanding. And you would expect a fall in any kind of um, credit spread, risk premium proxies, for example, the BA 10-year spread or the 10-year demand spread. And you would expect that something happens to the kind of leverage that is stressed a lot in this intermediary asset pricing literature, which is the broker-dealer leverage. All right. So how do we end up identifying noise shocks? So our procedure is based on this Bornig, Ambetti, Lippi, and Sala paper. 
And I'm just going to give you a brief verbal sketch of what they're doing and what we are uh, following. Um, so you need three key identification assumptions. The first one is that dividends are driven by a news shock. So um, news to dividends enters actual dividends with one period delay. The second identification assumption is that um, investors um, get some signal about this fundamental news shock, and this signal is noisy. And the third identification assumption is that this noise uh, shock uh, does not affect dividends in any way, like neither in the current period nor at any period in the future. And if you have the setup, you cannot infer the, uh, you cannot tease out what is the fundamental shock and a noise shock from lagged data. And at the time of the shock, uh, neither can the economic agents. But once you have future information, you can actually tease out what was a news shock and what was a, a noise shock. So you can use future information to know more about the economy than agents have at the time. All right. So in terms of what we actually do to get these noise shocks, like um, we use US data. We have 60 years of data. Um, and the first step is that we estimate a vector autoregression in log levels. This vector autoregression includes five variables, namely the three-month treasury rate to control for short rates, which could pos uh, possibly affect stock prices. Then we also include the uh, AAA corporate bond yield, which affects uh, stock prices through changes in risk premiums. Then we include dividends and stock prices, which are the obvious drivers of dividends and stock prices. And finally, we include real GDP as some measure of the business cycle. Like from this VAR, we get some reduced form innovations and then we um, impose a recursive identification scheme to orthogonalize the innovations of dividends and stock prices to innovations of the uh, short rate, the risk premium and real GDP. Um, and what we get from the second stage then is that we have some innovations to dividends and stock prices. And in a third step, we impose on these innovations a dynamic rotation that ensures that we identify those shocks as fundamental shocks that are in some way correlated to uh, current, past, or future dividends, and those shocks as noise shocks that are completely uncorrelated to current, past, and future dividends. And you can do this by essentially imposing a dynamic rotation on these residuals that you back out on the second step. Now, this is the noise shock that we back out of our data. Um, so the noise shock is standardized. So um, the variance or the standard deviation of the shock is one. Um, the shaded areas in this picture are the US recession dates. Um, and I've marked the five largest positive noise shock in blue and the five largest negative noise shocks in red. You can see that um, some of these noise shocks are around US recessions, um, but not all of them are. So this is not capturing directly the business cycle. And if you think about the kind of narrative that um, what happened during this, this was, for example, the Watergate scandal. Uh, this noise shock was around um, the um, like stock price bust of 1987. Uh, this series of positive noise shocks is around the dot-com bubble. Um, you have two shocks around the US elections, like the Bush re-election and the Obama re-election. And you have a big negative noise shock around the financial crisis, but you also have a noise shock around the euro area sovereign debt crisis. All right. So what are the effects of noise shock on credit? Um, so, this Charu and Truado paper shows that um, you can, like if you have a news representation of a shock process, like you have a shock that is driven by current surprise shocks and future signal shocks, you can write down a equivalent um, noise shock representation um, where the shock is driven by noisy news about the future essentially. 
And you can always write sort of a two equivalent um, representations. And what they also show is that like VARs have an issue in backing out noise shocks because like uh, these shocks like are non-fundamental in some way. Um, but what this Forney paper shows that indeed if you sort of um, have some identification procedure that relies on lagged data, that is an issue. But if you sort of um, have an identification procedure that relies on forward data, like on future data, you can actually back out these news and noise shocks. So this is taken care of. All right. So we look at the effections of noise shock on credit. We do this through local projections. And the kind of local projections that we look at are lag augmented local projections um, of the flux work and Weller type. Um, essentially, we have some outcome y at horizon t plus h um, that we regress on some constant. Um, S lags of the shock of interest. Some um, control variable, um, the lag of the outcome variable, some control variables that enter contemporaneously, some control variables that enter with a lag, a time trend, and then you have some residual. Um, y is the outcome of interest, and the control variables um, we split into two parts. We include as control variables the variables that we include in the original bar that we use to identify the noise shocks. And we include those variables that are ordered before dividends and stock prices contemporaneously. And we include those variables that are ordered after dividends and stock prices with a one period lag. To really replicate like the specification that we have in the VAR in our local projection framework. And what we're interested in is these beta SH coefficients essentially. And here I'm showing you first the effects of uh, these um, dividend use shocks and these noise shocks on dividends and stock prices. Um, and I'm showing you the effects of two different models. The red line is the impulse responses that you get from the original VAR. And the blue lines is the impulse responses that we estimate using local projection. Um, the first thing that you can see is that the red lines and the blue lines are usually um, pretty close to each other. So you estimate similar impulse responses with local projections and with the VAR. Um, this should be the case if you specify your local projections correctly, like uh, Michael Plagborg Müller has a paper where he shows an equivalence result with, uh, between local projections and the VAR. Um, but it's nice to see that this actually holds up in our specifications so because this gives us some trust that we actually specify our local projections correctly. Now, if you think more about the economics, what you can see if you first focus on dividends, which are the top two panels, you can see that the um, fundamental shock, the dividend use shock, has a positive effect on dividends. Um, and this effect on dividends is kind of permanent. So this effect um, basically in the VAR stays permanent and in the local projections also uh, stays permanent. If you look at the noise shock, the no noise shock is never, um, like never affects uh, dividends significantly at all time horizons. And this is something that is imposed by the identification. Now if you instead look at the effects of these fundamental shocks and the noise shocks on stock prices, you can see that there's a permanent effect of the fundamental shock on stock prices. Um, this is something that is actually not imposed by the model, so it's nice that it holds out in the data. And for the noise shock, you can see that there is an initial effect. Like in the beginning, agents see some noisy innovation. Um, to, like they get a noisy signal about dividends. In the beginning, they don't know whether this is a like news shock or a fundamental shock or a noise shock. Um, if they then see that there's nothing happening to dividends over time, they learn, okay, this shock was probably a noise shock, and then the uh, impact of the um, noise shock on the stock price mean reverse. Whereas like for the dividend shock, you see, okay, this shock is actually born out in the dividend series, and you see that there's sort of this permanent impact on stock prices. Um, again, like you might be worried about earnings, and we show that there's kind of a similar impact on earnings. Like, um, and if you look at the cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio, you can see that the impact on the cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio 
mean reverts for both the dividend shock and the noise shock, but the reason is different. For the noise shock, the price sort of mean reverts. For the dividend shock, the earnings go up. All right, then if we look at the impact of noise shock on credit, like we have now as the um, variable of interest in our local protections, the um, total non-financial credit. And what you can see is that a dividend shock has an impact on credit. Credit is sort of slow moving, so this impact on credit builds slowly, but then becomes permanent. And you have sort of this um, like 1% effect on total credit. Whereas if you look at the impact of a noise shock, you can see that in the beginning, the impact is identical, but as agents learn that the shock is actually a noise shock and not a dividend shock, you see that this uh, impact on total credit peaks and then mean reverts. And this is credit in levels. So if you think about credit growth, you have positive credit growth for around 10 to 12 quarters, and then the impact on credit growth mean reverts. Uh, impact on credit mean reverts, so you have negative credit growth. So in that sense, noise shocks in our empirical framework create a boom-bust cycle. Now, if you look at possible transmission channels, um, first, if you look at loans, what you see there is that uh, loans, you have a mean reverting impact for both the fundamental shock and the noise shock. Um, so if you instead look at bonds, you see that there appears to be some substitution going on between loans and bonds. Um, for the dividend shock, whereas for the noise shock, you see that there's sort of this um, cycle in both loans and bonds. Like you have um, initially that there's a lot of lending from the banks to the um, non-financial sector um, that goes away and is then substituted for by the non-financial sector borrowing more through bonds if you have a dividend shock. Whereas if you have a noise shock, you see that you have also this initial um, lending from the banks that goes away, um, and you have a similar cycle for the bonds, actually. And if you look a bit more into the details of the bank lending channels, so you don't see a lot in leverage or book equity and book assets, so if you look at total bank balance sheets, um, there appears to be nothing going on, but you see um, substitution uh, between assets on the bank balance sheets. So the share of loans in total bank assets is increasing and it's permanently increasing with the fundamental shock, whereas you have sort of this uh, mean reverting effect for the noise shock. And if you look more at the bond market channel, like for the um, dividend shock, what you can see is that you have a decline in credit spreads. You have the same decline in credit spreads for the noise shock. So in the beginning, agents expect that there's, okay, some positive signal to dividends. Um, this effect mean reverts for the dividend shock. For the noise shock, you actually get some boom-bust cycle in the credit spreads. So initially, you have a negative impact, um, and then after around 10 to 12 quarters, in line with sort of the quantity response, you get that credit spreads actually increase and then decrease afterwards. And if you look at like this um, broker-dealer capital ratio, you can see that like um, this. Um, increase, uh, decrease in credit spreads um, leads to, is associated with sort of an increase in broker-dealer capital ratio, so net worth becomes less scarce. Um, all right, let me briefly talk about state-dependent transmission and then uh, conclude by talking about real effects. So we are, of course, interested in understanding whether um, the, like, impact of these news and noise shocks is different uh, during times of high and low risk premiums. And this is motivated by this literature that studies whether like, there's a more amplification of financial shocks so if like, uh, you have like, um, high credit spreads compared to low credit spreads. And credit spreads usually are high when like, uh, financial intermediation is scarce, like if you have like, occasionally binding constraints or if you have a banking and like to set up sort of an alternative model, you could also have a model where high risk premiums um, instead imply times of high risk aversions. So where agents actually don't want to gamble whether a like, noisy signal is a noise shock and therefore uh, get, you get less amplification of asset price shocks. So 
our measure of the state of the of this credit cycle of the state of financial intermediation is um, the credit spread. We use the BAA credit spread, and we essentially follow the literature on state-dependent local projections and have sort of some smooth state transition. And you can see the credit spreads were low in the 1960s and the 1970s, then again in the early 1990s and in the early 2000s. All right. And essentially, um, what you see is that uh, during times of low risk premiums, you have more amplification of noise shocks. In particular, like noise shocks do not have effects on uh, total credit during times of high risk premiums at all. Whereas during low, times of low risk premiums, they seem to have much stronger effect on risk premiums. And if you look at where this is coming from, this does not seem to be driven by loans, but this seems to be driven to completely by the bond market. So you have much stronger effects of um, noise shocks on the bond market during times of low risk premiums. All right, let me briefly say something about real effects and then conclude. Essentially, and this is in line with the literature on youth shocks, you get a permanent effect of uh, fundamental shocks on GDP, and you get sort of a weak transitory effect on, of noise shocks on GDP. And these transitory effects are also, uh, or like the effects of noise shocks on GDP are also stronger during times of low credit spreads. All right, in the end, we also like, um, have a structural model to rationalize this, but let me skip this for um, time reasons. Um, to conclude, I showed you that um, noise shocks can lead to credit boom bust cycles, and that the amplification of these noise shocks is stronger during times of low credit spreads, which goes a bit against any type of explanation that builds on occasionally binding financial constraints or banking crisis, and more in favor of explanations of like time varying risk appetite. 